awesome. Um, so my, my name is uh, Nick Woodbridge. So I'll be talking today about how uh, GSK is leveraging a micro lake house architecture paradigm to enable our business. I'm actually fairly impressed by the turnout of this. I figured everybody would be next door and with the uh, Adidas guys talking about ML. So it's, I'm happy to actually see people are passionate about this topic and you guys are uh, sitting in this room with me for the next uh, 40 minutes. Uh, so I've got about 30 minutes of presentation and then I actually have, there's some technical team members in this, um, in the room. So if you guys have any in-depth questions, we can uh, you know, come up front or you can ask them in the Q&A session and we can uh, cover it at the end. So I'd like to pose a question to everybody. Why in 2023 are we still talking about monoliths when it comes to data lakes? Whenever we see a presentation, no, no offense to our Databricks friends, but whenever we see this presentation on the lake house, it's got a single, right? It's got our single monolithic lake house that covers all these related use cases, but we never see it depicted as the multiple entities that, that I think we need to be talking about at this point in time. You know, sure, in the last two years with the data mesh architectures that is coming out, you're starting to see it being broken apart. But I feel like as a community, you know, we're really not discussing it at the level that, that it has been on the application services side of things. And you know, from an industry perspective, I mean, let's put this in context, right? We're 20 years from the famous Jeff Bezos, you know, API or die, leave Amazon uh, email. You know, 14 years from the Netflix microservices stack, and, and we're 10 years from that famous uh, Steve Yeggy uh, Google platform rant, you know, that went around on GitHub. But we're still, we're still thinking about lake house architectures. We're still seeing, you know, how, right? You know, it, if, if you have a lake house, if you build it, if you do it as a monolith, if it's getting, if it's getting used to the fullest possible use, that's all that we all, that's all we hope for, right? We, we talk about, you know, petabytes of data we're ingesting. We talk about, um, you know, how, how many new ingestion jobs we can start. We, we think about this through the lens of like technology and not through the aspects of like business enablement. So through this next 30 minutes, I'll be walking you guys through our journey uh, in this space, and, and hopefully we can like, uh, leave with, with some approaches that you can take back and, and think about how you break apart your own data lake and data lake architecture. So from a background perspective, um, so my name is Nick Woodbridge. I spent the early part of my career in FinTech, leading application development teams. We were doing, at the time, the first web applications. Uh, we were you know, wrapping AS400 systems launching these as web apps and, and enabling uh, you know, the FinTech se sector. I moved uh, to AWS EC2, was on one of the first uh, uh, you know, EC2 instance product launch teams right when uh, Microsoft and Google were coming to the market. We, we built an AWS and EC2, we built and launched 18 products in two years. Um, and then I came to Texas and opened Texas as a solution architect for, for cloud transitions. Um, I then went over to join Adobe from a uh, solution architecture for marketing space, uh, enabling digital transformations at the time that were really popular from an omni-channel uh, marketing use case perspective. And then I'm now back in industry. Um, so I first came, when I joined GSK, I led a data development team um, and we built one of the biggest uh, data platforms using Hadoop technology on premise. And then now I head up the commercial architecture for sales and marketing uh, within, within GSK. So who is GSK? Um, we're a top 10 global pharmaceutical company, kind of almost as legacy as it gets from an industry sector perspective. Um, we, from a commercial and marketing perspective, we, we have um, many commercial products. So we've got about 50 plus products um, covering you know, vaccines, general medicines, uh, specialty, specialty care. Um, and, and, it's, and we're launching those in 80 markets. Um, and, and these are aligned to five, five major global regions. And from a commercial tech perspective, uh, we're, we're about four years in on our Databricks journey. So, so we came from an on-premise, uh, you know, legacy uh, data warehousing solutions, legacy ETL solutions. Um, we, we then, you know, using, you know, uh, kind of legacy warehousing vendors. I uh, hope nobody's, you know, from, from one of those companies. But, um, and, and then in the middle of this, we, we went a digital transformation. So from, an, from a marketing and sales perspective, everyone started talking about omni-channel, omni-channel analytics, um, sales enablement, digital reps, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so, so this then took us uh, to the cloud. So, so we, we you know, selected Azure, we selected Databricks, 
um, and we migrated all of these um, on-premise warehouses out into the Databricks and, and, and Azure environment, and, and we um, have now scaled it up to be a multi-petabyte um, using this kind of micro lake house design. And, and we support about 400 commercial use cases, um, everything from you know, small you know, uh, in-market uh, ask out to you know, major uh, you know, ETL and, and ML, advanced analytics, uh, content generation, those kinds of things. But when we went to the cloud, uh, we, 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 you know, we, we came as a big ball of mud, right? I mean, we, we brought our tightly coupled design, we brought the traditional pipelining, we brought the traditional warehousing, managed it by a central team, and we just can't, carried it from on-premise out to the cloud. But in the last three years, we've really been working on picking that apart, using these kind of like advanced uh, uh, architectural considerations and design practices, and we've actually broken apart this, this monolithic uh, lake and, and built out our micro lake house uh, design. So getting into the actual uh, heart of the presentation, so from an architectural practice perspective. So for those of you that may not be coming from the application development um, perspective or, or uh, space, you know, there, there's really like six major practices uh, for decomposition of monolithic applications. I mean, this is, again, a common thing in the commercial application uh, perspective to take a legacy monolithic application, decompose it into microservices, and release it out in the cloud. I mean, we, you know, it's tried and true. So when we, when we looked at it from a architectural practice, there were kind of, you know, these three main areas that we were uh, taking our, our, um, uh, our, our uh, monolithic lake and, and breaking it apart. So we, we looked at it through the lens of, you know, how do we decompose by business capability? Um, you know, how do, we, how do we enable the business, talk to the business in business terms and enable them with the capabilities that they want within the data and analytics space? We, we looked at the organizational business processes, we looked at those capabilities, and we broke apart a large portion of our estate um, doing that kind of stuff. Then we fell upon the, the kind of classic domain-driven design, software, you know, as a service, um, you know, uh, decomposition by subdomain. So, so within the kind of uh, um, application estate, you know, how do we break it into these smaller subdomains? How do we look at the infrastructure and think about it and encapsulate that, that infrastructure component and, and drive it out as a domain-driven design? And then, and then we had our you know, typical you know, SLA-based, you know, hey, we need a Databricks workspace. You know, we need a, um, you know, some market some, somewhere in the globe asking us, you know, hey, we need data from the lake. So, so we, we leveraged the kind of idea of you know, building out a service per team pattern and, and, and turning that back over to the team. So letting the individual team manage that. Um, and we leveraged all three of these and, and we built this, this whole kind of um, micro lake house just based on common tried and true architectural practices. So let's kind of start with like the, the, the um, you know, the, the, the monolith, right? You know, this, this, you know, ugly slide, but, but, you know, Databricks likes to kind of make it a lot nicer, but it's, it's effectively the same, right? I mean, you've got your global data lake on the left-hand side, you've got your data products, your data warehousing, your AIML, Databricks offers all of that. This is the lake house, you know, paradigm, right? You know, that the, you can buy one data and analytics platform, and it can enable you throughout uh, your, your entire data and analytics estate needs. But, but now, like, and this is kind of what happened to us in 2020, right? You know, so, so now the, the marketing team comes to us and they say, well, you know, you've built this wonderful data product that does customer segmentation, but we want to activate it. We want to, we want to put it on the CDP. We want to activate it through our omnichannel email capabilities. You know, go ahead and activate it, right? You know, just, just get it to work, right? You know, that kind of, you know, thing. Um, our, our next best experience engine, you know, same thing. You know, we, we want to connect to the CRM solution. We want to deploy it out globally across many different CRM solutions. We want you to, you know, uh, drive actual actions within the field force. Um, again, you know, just, just go do it. Go make it happen, right? Um, you know, our, our, our warehouse started having issues with the Power BI reports that we were generating. Uh, the, um, you know, dashboard usage is going through the roof. The, the sales and marketing team is always coming to us and saying, oh, well, you know, we have some new vendor partner that has some new way to do segmentation and it'll drive revenue growth. You know, just, just fix it, make it work, right? I mean, it's, you know, and so, and so this, this, this doesn't scale, right? I mean, it, it starts to have issues. You know, one central team can't manage it. One central budget can't manage it. That, that, it, just, it just starts to kind of fall in upon itself and, you know, maybe you build a great services organization, you can handle every incident and every ticket, 
but you know you start having these small little fires in these like small little areas and it starts to kind of like add up. And, and this was my experience in R&D, right? You know, building it from an on-premise perspective. You, you eventually get to be too big, and it's too big of an IT budget, it's too big of a you know, target. You know, what exactly are you doing for us? That's a big line item on that expense you know, thing. You know, what? I don't really under, fully understand it. So, so it's like you, you, you eventually grow out of this, um, this model, and, and this is really what, what, like I said, the commercial team, you know, what, what my team has kind of built out to, to drive it out. So if we kind of go one, one step further, right? So, so looking at that first list, you know, the, the idea of the business capabilities. Like, so how, how do you take central data products and break them out to business, discrete business capabilities? And this is what we did, right? So, so you know, if you look at business capabilities, you open up any, any sales and marketing, uh, uh, you know, document generated by any consultant, and, it, and it's all about, you know, customer journey analytics. It's all about segmentation. It's all about next best experience. It's about social listening. It's, it's this, you know, capability set. Any one of us in the room can open it up in any market it, for any business domain, and, and we can read that list, and we can, like, understand what that means. So, so we started working backwards from that, right? You know, talk to the business in business terms. Um, so, we, so we started to break apart the products. We, we started to um, a aggregate you know, the customer journey products into one workspace or, or you know, in the case of um, you know, segmentation, maybe it's multiple workspaces. So we started to kind of break it apart and overlay those, the, um, those kind of resources and, and, and the data products themselves and kind of bring it all together. Um, then, like the, the key on this is it allows you to push it out and it allowed us to push it out through, through a matrix brand and market combination. So in the case of sales and marketing, not every brand in every market is sophisticated enough to need digital customer journeys, right? You know, if you're in a in a market um, and and you you know your your whole you know your whole channel delivery is a sales rep going in and visiting a doctor, you know, a, a in person kind of aggregation, you don't need customer journeys. You don't need to you know see like oh hey they clicked on this website they signed up for this you know seminar. You you don't need that kind of customer journey based um, experience. So by aggregating our customer journey and, and, and in this kind of architectural um, paradigm under that, under that guise of business capability, it, it, it allows us to you know, give the markets that want, that want this, you know, we, we just give it to them, right? We say, hey, here's your customer journey. You come to us, you want a customer journey? Here's your customer journey. And, and it allows us to then charge those markets what the development costs are, and what the, the Databricks and Azure costs are. So, so if, if you are a market that needs customer journey, you pay for your customer journey, and you know exactly what your costs are gonna be to, to kind of generate the, the customer um, journey capabilities. And the other big advantage is um, from a core team development, like we didn't have to build a customer journey that handled every market and every region, and you know, no, no IT project said, oh, well, you know, we gotta get everything, we gotta get to 100%, right? You know, that's like, I think you know, everybody's got that list, like, oh, we gotta get to 100%. Um, we didn't have to do it, right? We, we built the product once, we built it for our major market, we rolled it out for our major market, we took it to them, they like it, they use it, um, and, 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 and the key on that from a data perspective is, you know, the data density that you need for customer journeys may not be there. So if you're building this as a core solution and you're building it within one team and you want to address it, you're having to handle that use case of, oh, there's no data. Like, I got to build a defensive product now that like handles the case where there's no data. But in our case, if, if, if there's no data, there's no product. Like, we, we don't have to roll it out. We don't have to think about it that kind of that way. And, and those benefits really drove us at the business capabilities perspective from a microservices or micro lake house architecture paradigm. So then kind of looking at the, at the warehousing, right? So, so, you know, warehousing, you know, every, every major market, every major region had a warehouse. They all had them on premise. We all brought them out. You know, they had their, their um, you know, all their different uh, schemas and, and warehouse models. Um, so for this, you know, we, like I said, we took a domain-driven design approach. We said, okay, let's look at all the warehouses. How many, you know, how many databases? How many tables? What's the schema associated with it? And then we set up these bounded contexts that, that encapsulated the designs in that, in that, in that domain. So, so our first kind of like major subdomain was just around regions, you know, you could see it, you know, we saw, okay, well, there's a US, you know, warehouse that has all the US, you know, America's kind of needs. There's a Europe warehouse that has all the European needs. We, we could, you could see it through the physical infrastructure 
that, that each of these needs were, were independent and needed to be kind of encapsulated with, through that first layer. Um, then, then what was interesting is once we got down a la layer further, um, you know, we found out that you know, major use case was, was KPI driven, right? You know, hey, what's, what, you know, how is my brand doing in market today versus yesterday versus you know, this week versus last week? You know, how's this brick and territory doing versus that one? So we could see the, the KPIs, and, and we knew we needed to generate those KPIs and ge generate them globally. So we encapsulated it. We, we, we took all the KPIs out of all these different warehouses, we put them all together, we ran them as a, as a central team, and, and, we, and we bounded that context, we bounded that context through that subdomain-based model. And then we also then you know, allowed for the ad hoc, um, you know, typical kind of warehousing, um, warehousing needs. And, and, and so, and again, you know, from a, a delivery perspective, you know, it, for the markets that had big warehousing needs with, you know, hundreds of Power BI developers, you know, there you go, that's your cost, you know, this is your, your allocation. Um, you know, we could also then gain efficiencies and scales because you don't have to generate your own KPIs, you can leverage our KPI layer. So you don't need to pay a consultant to come in and regenerate the wheel, you know, eight times, we have it and we can centralize it. So, so we created that subdomain, the bounded context, and that gave us the flexibility on these delivery models to drive, drive it out um, you know, and meet the markets kind of where they needed. And then, and then you know, for the advanced analytics and ML, you know, get in, get out, get out of their way. Um, you know, hey, you need access to, to the lake. Um, you, you've got your own consultancy, you, know, you name it. There's lots of them in the sales and marketing space. You know, here, here you go, right? You know, here, here's your workspace, here's what you need. You know, here, you tell us what access to data you need, we govern it that way, we mount it in, and then you're off and you can kind of go do your own work. And, and so, and, and, and this, you know, and again, like we, we had no value in that value chain. And so giving a service and giving it out to the per team, showing them what the costs look like, and, and allowing the brands and the, and, the, and, the, and the markets to understand what their costs are, I mean, you know, fantastic. You know, they, they love this, this kind of paradigm in this model. And so, if, and so if we kind of bring it all back, so what did this do to our lake house? Like how did, we, how, did, how did this change and kind of cause this effect? And when I talk about 400 use cases, you know, th this is kind of like the key, key understanding, right? So, so something like KPI, with that, with that domain context, we, we actually pulled that back into the global data lake. We, we set up a fourth layer in the lake. We said, hey, you know, we have raw and rich curated KPI. And, and we centralized those processes and, and, and we focused on the, the value creation of a KPI and, and, and delivering that you know, cheaper, faster, better, um, you know, doing all that kind of work. Um, and, then, and then we split, split the rest of the lake, right? So, so we split it out to you know, a core lake, you know, a region one lake, a region two lake, a region three lake, a region four, a region five. I mean, you know, we, we, can, we can keep going. N, N number of lakes, right? You know, and, 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 and so that wraps those use cases, that wraps the cost, it wraps the budget, it wraps, wraps everything in to a pre-package and pre-kind of deliver um, idea. And then, and then inside that space, you know, we can focus on our product engineering and product delivery, we can focus on the omni-channel. We, you know, it, you know, I mean, the great thing about kind of microservices and even, you know, with, with uh, Databricks, I mean, there's APIs for everything, right? So if we want to do product development and we want to roll it out to six lakes, 10 lakes, 20 lakes, great, there's an API for that. You know, there, we can build out a CI-CD pipeline. We can do the same work that, that, has, that, the, that the application architecture teams have done for, you know, two decades on, you know, you build it once and you can deploy it into anywhere. And, and there's almost no cost for that, right? Um, and, then, and then through the warehousing, especially with some of the new innovative products that have been coming out, we're able to do the same thing, right? So, so you know, there's now a REST API to submit you know, um, any, any SQL that you wanna do as part of a warehouse. Um, we, we put that behind a microservice. And so we now have you know, microservices sitting in our you know, omni-channel orchestration um, uh, engine that are, that are executing you know, SQL statements against uh, the, the warehouse, right? And, and I mean, couldn't, couldn't do that, right? You couldn't do that 10 years ago. I mean, so this is kind of like why I think it's, you know, all these things are kind of coming in. Um, and, and, so, and so if we carried this, this model all the way out, I mean, you know, this is where we, we have like the 400 different microservices, different products, different warehouses, different brand market combinations, all wrapped in these different domain, um, you know, kind of, kind of aspects. 
So, so the, the other kind of interesting thing that happened out of this was that we uncovered this like flywheel effect, right? Um, so again, you know, kind of a classic, um, you know, flywheel effect, you know, it's, it's about, you know, how do you build the small, wi small wins for your business? How do they then build on each other over time and eventually gain, you know, so much momentum that growth, you know, seems to happen by itself, right? I mean, so, so we can now scale this out or, or you know, I think, our, our data lake grew by 50% next year. It'll probably grow by another 60% this year. It, it doesn't matter, right? The flywheel effect is, is in full effect, right? We, we can grow this infinitely without any concerns about budgets, without any concerns about you know, where these costs are being allocated, who's the budget owner. You know, we, we've, we've really cascaded this out um, you know, to the business. And so, and so how we did that is, um, so like kind of looking at this innovation flywheel effect, right? So, so the, the micro lake architecture, so aligning the commercial data lake product to the business use cases and budgets, right? So this first, this first box on the, on the far left, um, you know, that's the core of this, right? That's the starting kind of, you know, perspective, right? Aligning the commercial products warehousing to the business use case and to the budget, right? That's number one kind of thing in this, in this flywheel effect. Then once, you know, this is the whole digital transformation, right? You know, business and technology alignment, right? So once we have the alignment, we have then the business buy-in to make investments in technologies, but not just centrally, right? So, so you know, hey, uh, you know, Databricks just rolls out their new SQL engine, you know, like trying to go get core central budget funding to go redo all the warehouses. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a Herculean kind of task. But I can guarantee you there's somebody in your business that there's some analyst, there's some, you know, sales ops person, there's some marketeer that, that wants, you know, a modern, you know, warehouse kind of experience. And, and they're willing to pay for it. They've got budget. They, they, they're sitting there in your business waiting for you to come to them, and they will buy into the, that kind of technology investment. Then you make the investment, right? So, so in the case of um, you know, the, the Photon uh, DB SQL, it was like, oh, hey, take, take traditional Spark SQL you know, jobs. It, it, you know, even though the DBU costs will be higher, you're, you're, you should see a net savings of 50, 50 to 95%. And, and okay, you know, great. Again, you know, IT project, you know, like I'm not going to take that risk. I'm not going to sign up for like, you know, a more expensive service that may deliver. But again, you know, somebody in the business is willing to sign up for that. So we rolled it out to a few of our data products. And guess what? We saw 50% cost savings. We saw 95% cost savings. We saw the technology investment with little risk on our side because we're sitting there hand in hand with our business partner, with the business buy-in. The person, you know, at the time it was a, it was a sales 360 report, you know, they liked the product, but it was too expensive. And they're like, hey, how can we reduce costs? Well, this is how you do it. Um, so, but then, then the fascinating part, so kind of getting down to box four, after you make the investment, um, it, it frees up budget, right? It frees up, you know, this kind of innov innov innovation, reinvestment kind of opportunity. So, so if you're doing cost savings, then, then, you know, I mean, more often than not, the business is like, okay, well, you know, thanks for saving us the money. Uh, you know, what can we do with it next, right? You know, like, it's not like the money comes out and they're putting it against P&L and they're like, oh, well, you know, we have issues with that. Like, chances are they've already allocated it to you as an IT, as an IT organization, and, and they're willing to make that investment. They're willing to kind of go, go per pursue um, innovation. And in, and in our case, again, it, it was, it, it happened to be Unity Catalog. So they were like, they had a use case in the, in the business where they wanted to share data with other third-party vendors. And, and, and so they were more than happy to take the money that we saved them and make that kind of reinvestment loop. That kind of comes now to box five, right? So, so now we're seeing the returns of that. So now we've, we've taken the same kind of project. We've done two innovation cycles, one being DB SQL, one being Unity. Um, and, and, that, and that allows us to then expand the micro lake house, right? It, it allows us to span, expand the micro lake house. Because, you know, if you look at my old, you know, I, I, in, the, in the previous architecture diagram, we're still running a monolith in our lake, right? In our core lake, lake it's still completely monolithic. Our, all of our ETL pipelines, all of our data assets, everything's sitting in the monolith. Now that we have Unity, we can start to break that out, right? We, we've got now the, the um, you know, kind of the replacement for Hive. We can start to share these data assets even within the core lake, and we can, and we can drive out you know, the further step of, of micro lake house architecture and, and, and design. So, th so this flywheel effect is, is, is very, very transformative you know, for us. It allows us to kind of keep the innovation cycle moving, and, and it also kind of delivers the, the, the value back to the, to the business itself. 
So, so just you know, kind of recap. Um, I know I've got like five minutes, and then we can jump on questions. Um, so, you know, from architectural practice, from lessons learned, you know, number one, right? You know, get close to the use case. Um, so, so if you don't understand, you know, where, you know, if if you can, if you only see your lake house as the monolith, you only see the data being ingested, you only see the queries coming back. If you don't understand how that's having an impact of of, of your business, you don't understand who the owner is of that use case that actually is using. The, the query using the insight using the ML model, you know, you, I mean, you, you won't be able to make this transition, right? No, no one will give you the funds to kind of start down this path. You have to be at the use case. You have to have, you know, undergone the digital transformation from an organization perspective in order to make this kind of leap. Um, then start with the consumption use cases. So, so if, if, if you're enabling the business, the business will always find you funds, right? I mean, that's, you know, if you're helping them, they're gonna help you. So, so start in that consumption space. Start with the data products, start with the data warehousing, start with things that your customer, you're actually can point to that and say, okay, that is driving revenue, that's driving insight, that's driving, you know, something that's moving the, the, the business forward. And, and, and that's where you want to start, right? You know, just don't, don't take something that's like behind the scenes that no one cares about. Um, don't try to run this on some, you know, warehouse that nobody really wants to pay for. Um, you know, you won't, you won't be able to get it. You won't be able to get there, right? You won't be able to, to make this, this, um, this transition. And, 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 then, and then the flywheel effect, right? So, so get those business wins, right? You know, focus, you know, what are the high priority things? How do I enable you to do this cheaper, to do it faster, you know, get the innovation cycle going. You know, don't be asking, you know, don't be trying to do, you know, uh, microservice kind of uh, uh, work and then also being saying, hey, I need innovation funds at the same time. Like if you're asking for both, you probably won't get it. It's too risky. The business won't understand the value. You have to get those first wins. You, ha you have to prove the value, um, you know, from a paradigm perspective. And so, and so what's, you know, you know, where are we going, right? So, so obviously, you know, I kind of called it out. We, we, our data lake is still very monolithic. Um, even its expenses are starting to kind of hit the top of the budget. We are gonna start breaking that out, right? So if you look at a region and you look at like, you know, here's the data that I need within my region, we wanna be able to show you exactly what that cost is, whether it's the storage cost, whether it's the, you know, ETL pipelining cost, like we wanna be able to decompose the global data lake. Um, and, and, we're, and we're excited about some of these upcoming uh, Databricks products to help us, you know, get to that level of granularity and detail. Um, we're also, like I said, um, starting to actually add, you know, true REST API microservices on top of the um, orchestration of the data products. Um, it, you know, this, this whole kind of idea of like decision engines and, and the ability to take and orchestrate insights within your data products and then drive them out through the operational plane. That's a huge, um, I think it's, you know, I think it's probably be the next big, big, big area of, of investments in, in terms of actually pulling together and driving without a human in, in involvement, actually driving insight and, and driving kind of that, that delivery. Um, and, then, and then finally, you know, from a self-service, you know, kind of mechanism perspective, um, we've seen great success with um, partnering with Databricks on like well-architected practices. So like if we, if we look at like, okay, we, we just created, you know, 10 ML environments last year for, you know, 10 different markets, you know, setting up that well-architected practice, building out what all those pain points are, then that allows you to make the reinvestment to say, okay, hey, you know, here, here's what you need to be doing in order to be more efficient or, or being able to, to deliver things more effectively. And obviously then, you know, wrapping that, you know, from an automation infrastructure as code um, and, and, and delivering it out like that.